G'day guys, Shrek here. Obviously you're interested in getting better at spearfishing, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Filling in for Turbo today, who's off comms, hopefully he's all good. But uh, saying hello from China today, he's uh, he's been doing a bang up job over there uh, in Australia without me. Uh, him and Pat are running the magic show that you guys listen to every fortnight. Today's episode is no different. We are joined by Moss Burmester from New Zealand. He's four, he's represented New Zealand in four different disciplines, including Olympic swimming, uh, spearfishing. Uh, just let me go. Yep, spearfishing, surf, lifesaving, swimming, and underwater hockey. Uh, he's competed in the Olympics twice. And this interview is a cracker because we talk about some of the, the crossovers and parallels that he's been able to take from um, c- competing at the highest levels in various disciplines and applying to spearfishing. It's quite interesting. Uh, we, we dig into a little bit into training regimes and some of the transferable skills and maybe some... Uh, some I also ask a f- couple of questions about diet, which I thought was pretty interesting. I uh, don't know if anyone else will, but um, see what you think. Now, a couple of shout-outs before we get started. John Ashley. Uh, yelled out to us on Facebook. He said, um, applied all my new spirit podcast learnings and just chilled right out on my last dive. He said, I enjoyed it so much more than previously. So that's awesome. Love getting feedback like this. Also, 2017 Freshwater Spearfishing Championships, the national champs are over in Lake McConaughey in Nebraska. It's August 26. Uh, there's a whole lot of... Um, of prizes to be won. Looks like an absolute cracker event. Uh, the last comp that was ran in Lake Mead was just uh, uh, awesome by the sounds of it. A lot of guys went over and enjoyed that. I don't think they got the quite the abundance of, uh, of species they wanted, although um, there was some cracker fish taken in that tournament. I'm sure the national champs August 26 in Lake McConaughey will, will be no different. Uh, freshwater spearfishing is definitely uh, an interesting take on the sport and far more challenging than a lot of us uh, no and believe. Now, a uh, couple of cracker podcast reviews. Just want to read them out. Gypsy Spiro, he says on iTunes and his iTunes review. Thanks for that, by the way. If you only listen to one episode, make number seven, where towards the end, Shrek summarizes his overarching spearfishing advice and true laid-back New Zealand lifestyle. After Trevor and Turbo put up an extended constructive spearfishing dialogue, Shrek swoops in and announces... Just don't be a dickhead. And Gypsy Sparrow says, right on, Shrek. Thanks for that, buddy. Uh, Yups, he says, the amount of tips, ideas, and laughs I've had from Shrek and Turbo uh, has improved my spearfishing tenfold. It's essential for any Sparrow. Highly recommend it. You won't regret it. Always hang in for the next episode. Keep it up, boys. And while you're at it, he says, buy their book, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. It's available on Amazon, iBooks, anywhere you like. But uh, thanks to that Yup's champion review, buddy. And also, guys, get on to waundersea.com. That's waundersea.com. There's a nationwide, Australia-wide, nationwide competition going on to land the biggest Spanish mackerel. It's not a difficult competition to get involved with. There are some huge Spanish mackerel being landed at the moment all the way around Australia. Seems to be a good time of year for it. Check it out, waundersea.com, and get your entries in. There's some absolute bloody cracker prizes in there as well. So um, there's a there's a video you can also watch to find out how to how to get involved and get in get get entered. Uh, another comp that runs year round is our sponsors, our major sponsors competition at spearfishing.com.au. They also have a neat competition that runs year round on there as well. Get involved, guys. It's never as hard as you think. You, um, generally, you've just got to have a, a good set of scales nice photos and you know a couple of witnesses and and in your way and laughing i haven't read all the details for the wa under seek club comp but biggest spanish mackerel it's a no-brainer get into it hook in um right so a bit more bit more news so the fr- the private facebook group uh that we have going is is going pretty good it's uh we're, we're getting we're getting some numbers on there we're getting some action and we're starting to have some interesting conversations it'd be great if you joined us as well so if you want to get uh, be part of that and also get your hands on 10 tips to get better at spearfishing go to noobspiro.com sign up for our email newsletter there's heaps of different ways to do it and you get a couple of freebies sent to you and you can also get access to this private facebook group where you can discuss all the issues that you have and perhaps um, give us ideas for new episodes and so on and just join us join the community in a, in a, in a bigger way uh, awesome so and uh, yeah the website and podcast now back up in business you can find it on itunes again had a slight some slight 
uh, tech difficulties there. But yeah, that's about all, guys. So I won't hold you up any longer. Hook into Moss Burmester from New Zealand. He's an absolute champion. Recently, he shot a huge marlin, uh, New Zealand world record, uh, New Zealand record over there. It's a bloody special fish. So without further ado, let's get into this episode with Moss. Choice. Guys, support the Noob Sparrow podcast by shopping with today's sponsor, spearfishing.com.au. That's right, you can use the code Noob Sparrow and save $20 on all purchases over $200. If you're looking for that next spear gun or wetsuit, then spearfishing.com.au has got a huge range of equipment for you to go and check out. There's good reviews on there about everything from booties to budgie smugglers, so enjoy and get hold of something good. If you live here in Australia, check out Adreno's physical stores in Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane and join over 60 underwater experts to get advice about everything you need for equipment. Thank you for shopping with our sponsor, spearfishing.com.au and supporting the Noob Sparrow podcast. G'day Noobers, welcome to today's Noob Sparrow podcast. We're in for a treat. We've got a four-time representative of New Zealand in different sports. He's represented New Zealand in uh, swimming at the Olympics, surf lifesaving, underwater hockey, and also spearfishing. So mm. it's great to have Moss Burmester to join us today. Is Have I saying your name right, Moss? Yeah, you are, yeah. Uh, pleasure to be on here, and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me on. Cool. Turbo's been itching to have another Kiwi on the show. He I've been loves itching it. to have another high-performance athlete on the show besides yeah. myself, so it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, well, it's, it's it's hard when you're surrounded by Kiwis, you know, because we're all high performance, really. Um, I feel like I'm surrounded by turkeys some, a lot of the some time. Some of us choose to go in the Olympics, but <laughs> others of us just eat buckets of chicken. So, what do you do? All right, boss, it's, it's it's a pleasure to have you on the line today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background with um, spearfishing and some of the other disciplines you've competed in, and uh, just give us a bit of your background on how you got started with it all. Yeah, so I basically was raised because of my family was always around the water. So mum and dad were um, big into underwater hockey and, and just being diving in the ocean and that. Um, and so I got two younger brothers and myself. We learnt to swim because we were always out in the boat or around the pools. And they basically wanted to know that if we fell in the water, we would be okay. Okay. Um, so that's how we, you know, we started with all the water sports, really swimming and, and spearing and underwater hockey and all that and surf life saving and. Um, so my first memories really are, are sort of being out in charter boats and coming back from being out, you know, out to the further islands and when big rolling seas and things like that. So, um, yeah, grew up on the water and just absolutely loved it. And um, as far as spearfishing goes, the first one that I ever well, fish you ever shot, I think I was around the age of 11 or 12 and uh, it was on a pole spear. Yep. And, my, and I remember dad saying to, I was out with a couple of cousins who were at my age and they said, look, whatever, dad said, whatever fish you spear, you have to fill it and eat. <laughs> and of course, the first fish that I speared was like a couple of Maori wrasse and, and, you know, they basically, they swim up to you. Um, and so I remember spearing these, you know, these Maori wrasse that I thought was, uh, in, you know, New Zealand Maori wrasse, they're very, very easy to spear. Yep. Um, and I thought I was, you know, the, the big king, the last of the great white hunters, <laughs> and until I had to fill it and eat it, and then I've never speared one since. So <laughs> They don't taste any good? No, nah, they're not the greatest tasting fish, and, okay. and there's actually, you know, there's no challenge at all to shooting them, yeah. so I, I soon kind of moved on to better things. Uh, so what, what part of New Zealand did you grow up in? Uh, so I was born in Hastings, but I was only there for about three months, and then I grew up in Tauranga. So yes. um, Tauranga has got great access to, you know, um, a lot of the islands out from there. And we also have always had a batch in the Coromandel at Wongamata. Yeah, okay. So we're weekends and long sort of summer holidays, we were always up at Wongamata, you know, and that's where I learned to surf and spearfish and things like that too. Well, I lived in Wongamata for about a year. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good part of the world. That, that, uh, that, and Mac, I... Uh, Sorry, there's a place outside of Pyro. I did my uh, scuba diving instructor's tickets there. So it's a, oh, yeah. I know that part of the world yeah, pretty Moss, well. you're going to get a lot of um, memory Nostalgia. Lane. You're going to yeah. get a lot of... We're going to go for a interruptions long walk with my unimportant lane. life story. Oh, so mate, he's get beaming. Used to it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good part of the world, the Coromandel, and there's uh, quite a few species as well. And, uh, yeah, those islands out there are pretty cool. Yeah, the Oldermans and Mercury Bay Islands out from Coromandel are, are pretty special. You know, they'll be some of the better spearing ground in New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, growing up in Tauranga, you had access to to um, to some sort of elite sporting coaching as well. When did you get sort of started seriously um, swimming and um, doing underwater hockey? 
Yeah, so the swimming kind of, I actually played a lot of other, you know, cricket, rugby and all those other things until I was 14 and then I took six months off and then uh, just before I was sort of turning 15, I decided that I wanted to come back to the sport of swimming and take it really seriously and um, and kind of dropped all the other sports, uh, except for obviously underwater hockey and swimming because they're water related and I was really fit and really fast, I could pick, you know, I kind of got picked for those teams just to be able to come in and, as kind of an impact player. Okay. So... So yeah, it was pretty easy transition, and then um, just started. You know, my training went from being four one-hour sessions a week to doing ten two and a half-hour sessions, swim sessions a week, and oh, wow. plus three gym sessions. And this is why I was still at school. And so I used to train in the morning for sort of two and a half hours, and I'd go and eat breakfast. And that, you know, back then I was uh, eating wheat bix and I used to eat on average sixteen wheat bix for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I'd go off to school and I'd usually be late to school but that was alright, the teachers let me come in late uh, and then I would be at school and then I would, uh, at the end of the day again I'd go home and eat and then I would go off to training again and um, that pretty much was you know the last couple of years of school and from there I just picked it up and carried on really, really seriously and made my first Commonwealth Games and first Olympic Games when I was um, still at home and still training in Tauranga. Yeah, wicked. And uh, later on in the interview when we get to the Veterans Vault, I wanna, we, we're going to discuss a little bit of how some of these high-performance sort of activities relate and have related into your spearfishing career. But I guess going back to sort of when you started spearfishing, um, what apart from like spearing fish that you had to eat and fill it and they didn't taste any good, what were some yeah. of the other obstacles you might have had? How did you overcome um, well, I've only really picked up a spear gun kind of more recently. So um, we, the main thing really that we went out for is we used pole spears and we just chased the butterfish really a lot yeah. and um, and just and go hunting for crayfish. And I, I still love it. And I, you know, I'm a bit like a terrier. You put me under a rock and I just want to keep going and finding them. <laughs> so um, and I love doing that. And that's it was you know it's a big family activity with dad and my brothers and stuff. And you know as you go out and want to catch crayfish and you often find them under holes and they often have multiple escape exits so you sort of you know work together as a family to be able to, to nail these crayfish so they didn't really have a chance when all of us got together <laughs> yeah right so yeah that was kind of it was and then um about four or five years ago i picked up i just saw you know you always see guys spearing bigger fish and i just thought i oh, went on to trade me here and i bought a, a rob allen 120 and um just because you know i talked to a few guys and they said oh you can't go wrong with a rob allen so mm. I, I bought one of those and wanted to get into the sport and really to, to be able to chase sort of snapper and kingfish and, and you know be able to sort of widen what i was going after yeah yeah cool and uh when you bought the gun you you started getting out a bit wider you already had a background in the water what were some of the species you started encountering with your with your brand new rob allen 120 <laughs> well, it was brand new to me, but it wasn't brand new gun. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. But it's I've still got it. I was being converted to you know cut the end off and turn it into a roller gun. Oh, but that's okay. all right. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I, one of the things that really helped me out, having been in the water for so long from the early age, is just that knowing the fish species, you know, identifying them and kind of knowing how they're going to act and behave. Okay. Um, and just being relaxed in the water. So I think I had a massive advantage there. And then um, I just, I actually did a um, a competition with my dad in the Coromandel, and uh, and we did all right. We got tenth, but we didn't really know what we we're doing. We just got the basics, you know, the blue mau mau and the butterfish, and we ended up tenth, which is pretty decent. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and then um, and I shot a few you know poor eye and some of those sort of other easier to shoot fish and then i sort of really wanted to pick up and we end up staying um the combination with a guy that was in the auckland freediving club and he he was sort of talking it was in july so it was going it was in winter and the spear fishing had got really bad and um and i just was wanted to carry on and he said well, why don't you come along and join the auckland freediving club get better at diving deeper and then uh, and then when summer comes around you'll be able to you know you can come out with me and you can get better and i thought that was a pretty sweet idea so yep. i joined the club and that it kind of went from there so that's how i got introduced into the to the freediving as well okay cool and you got compared did you get competitive with uh freediving as well did you have a good good go at competitions uh i haven't yet um i've been quite involved i mean again with my swimming background um so i retired from swimming in 2010 um at the end of it and then i kind of picked up the free diving of you know a few years ago so um, i still had all that sort of leftover aerobic fitness and things like that and the and the skills under the water okay um, so again i found it pretty easy and i was pushing um you know so i got involved with um a, a guy called jonathan sunnex over here yeah. um and he's been to 110 meters wow. uh, yeah. and he's considered kind of one of the best um instructors and and, t and trainers in the world johnny deep or something they call him yeah that's it yeah. johnny deep yeah 
Yep, and uh, and so he sort of he's a Kiwi as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm just looking at Turbo here. He knows, oh, I know. We, we, it was unspoken, but clearly. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> yeah, just me, William Trubridge, Johnny Deep, and Moss here. This is how we roll, Turbo. <laughs> you. <laughs> Uh, do you know a guy, Dave Mullins, too? You know, he's a Kiwi. Yeah, yeah, yeah shot the biggest Dave. fish in the recent World Champs. Yeah, just a typical <laughs> Kiwi bloke, really. Just, yeah. just another one. Nat Davey, world record, Yellowtail oh, Kiwi. Right. Oh, right. Hey, come on. <laughs> Let's get on with it, you, you blokes. Uh, yeah, pretty good rugby team, too, I believe. <laughs> 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 it's not going to stop, Tim. I'm not uh, letting it up. So, all right, all right. We've had a good sort of look at your background, Moss. Um, <laughs> I'm loving it. Uh what about a memorable fish? I mean, obviously you've only been going sort of six or seven years, but uh, you, maybe you've got a fish that stands out. Um, yeah, I think sort of the, the first one for me was, I guess, my first kingy. Um, well, there's a couple there. One was my first kingy, so that was, um, I was just out at Hen and Chicks, and again, this was when I was very first getting into it, and I went out with a guy who, who offered to take me out from underwater hockey, and he I kind of followed him around a little bit and watched him try to snoop a few snapper, and then he, you know, he dropped me off, said, go and work this weed line, and I jumped in, and again, it was in winter time, like, um, I think it was around June, and so this kingy swung up to me on the weed line, and I shot it front on, and um, and then it obviously, you know, shooting it front on the spear bent round, and I bent the spear, you know, it was oh, buggered wow. afterwards, yeah. but I had no idea, you know, I was just stoked to shoot this big kingy, and well, I thought it was massive, and it went about 20 kilos, but yeah. so in the winter time, it's a good size kingy, you know, and yeah, it's a yeah. decent kingy, but I, I remember he came over to the, brought the boat round and picked me up, and he said, how did you get on, you know, from in the water, and I said, oh, I, I think I shot a good kingy, and, he, and you could see him look at me, and he think, oh no, he was going, oh, I hope it's over that, the minimum mark of 75 centimetres, <laughs> you could see it on his face, and, um, but you know, once I handed it up to him in the boat, I think he was like, "Holy moly!" So it was, yeah, I was pretty stoked with that that right. kingy to be my first one. As you would be. Was that a seven mil shaft? Um, it was just whatever came with the Rob Allen. So uh, yeah, from memory, I think it was. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They, they 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 quite often go better with just that small upgrade eh, to the seven point five. They bend a whole lot less. But if you shoot a good kingy front on, they yeah. they love to bend <clears throat> shafts. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, as I didn't, I didn't really know much, you know, and I shot it, that, you know, sort of on that 45 front on, and by the time he took off and I was holding on for grim death and <laughs> just bent that spear right round. Yeah, kill cool. that. That would have been an awesome fish. Mm. Yeah, no. All right, um, now you've, you've, you've progressed a little bit. Uh, what's your favourite hunting technique and how do you employ it effectively? Um, well, I've got to, obviously I really enjoy hunting snapper in New Zealand. They're kind of, you know, the equivalent of hunting deer. Like you've got to be... You got to be really sneaky and, and kind of think about where the sun is and find good ledges and and snooping over the drop offs. So I really enjoy the skill of that that it involves in there and you know being really quiet. Yeah. Um. So my, actually the last one I shot though was my PB snap it went ten point one four kilos. So oh, 20, wicked. Twenty two or three pounds. That's awesome. Um, but fish. it was actually we were um, hunting for the spearfishing nationals that were coming up and I was just had a torch with me and um. I was actually looking at the bottom of a crack to see if there was any um, cod in this crack, the bastard cod, and there was none there. But as I brought the torch up, it kind of the crack opened up into this area, and there was just this, that 20 pound snapper sitting there. And I was oh. just pointing the torch at it, <laughs> and, it, and I had in my other hand, right hand, I had my spear, and I was just holding it, you know, midway down the tube. And um, and then I went, wow! And the snapper kind of looked at me and went, oh bugger, I've got nowhere to go. And he kind of just turned side on. And the only way he could have got out was to go for the surface and try to kind of basically go out over the the rocks that were washing on the surface and so i just really quietly moved my hand along the gun to the handle and then just brought the gun up and shot it so it was probably my biggest snap ever but definitely the easiest one i've ever yeah, shot nice. oh wow that's pretty cool <clears throat> and what sort of um right if we're going to go if you guys going to go out and start snooping snapper what are some of the the do's and don'ts of hunting snapper um the first one would be just i think being really quiet um you got to take the snorkel out you want to be aware of you know your gun's not bumping on any rocks or making your noises or sometimes you know if you pull the gun through the water the rubbers or the trace can kind of um you know that tension it hits against the side of the gun so it can make a little bit of noise yeah. um so i think number one that's is just being aware of your of the noise and then basically as you're swimming along any potential ledge that you see you want to be able to sort of sneak up on it from a, a, a wee way back um, and so you, if you you know if you swim right over it, you're not going to give yourself a chance to see the snapper. You often, when you do bugger it up, you see their tails disappearing in the distance. Yeah. So you got to start from further enough back that when you can creep up over the edge, you can. I like to hold on to the weed um, and really hold on to the weed and only just stick your head out over the edge and kind of look down and around nice and slowly and quietly. And um, 
I don't always worry about where the sun is. I mean, but having it behind you does help too because then you are sort of silhouetted and they just see us. If they do see you, they see a black silhouette rather than seeing actually being able to make out what, what it is you that you are. Okay, cool. Some good tips there. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I think the major thing too is just if you go out with someone who's shot a lot of snap before, just being able to follow them. I found that really, really helps. And just being able to follow long distance and just watch how they approach the rocks, where they start from, what they do, and that really, really helped me. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. And what are you? You're shooting these fish. Um, what's what's what size gun are you using? Are you trying to get a bit of distance on them? Are you using like a one three, or are you just still using that one point two RA? Or yeah, so um, because a lot of my focus now is on. I really enjoy the competitions, the competitive side of me, mm-hmm. and um, because of that, I'm using a one twenty, which is a pretty good all round gun. Mm-hmm. But I've moved to a carbon pathos one, mm-hmm. um, and it came. The pathos is here. They come with open muzzle, but I changed it to closed muzzle as well, and that's just for ease of loading really fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also that you don't have to have the mono on there when you're mm-hmm. when you're loading. So Please. because I've been in competitions where I've been, you know, had a fish that I've just in a school of like Trevally and Carway and Coes that are coming through. You shoot, you know, one fish like a Trevally, and then you're reloading the shaft straight away, and the Trevally's still alive and on the mono. Mm-hmm. And then you're shooting a car wire and then you push that through onto the mono and then you're trying to reload and shoot <laughs> something else, you know? So it's, it's all on. So in a competition, you want to make the guns as simple as possible. And so, you know, the pathos for me is it's a, I really enjoy the handle, how it fits in my hand. Yeah, they're nice. Um, they're nice. And, yeah. And, it, and the fact the trigger mechanism sits really high up in line with the barrel, I think that it lines your wrist up and, and therefore makes your shooting quite accurate. Mm-hmm. So, and it's a nice light gun and, it, and it's simple. And so that's what I've you know been using recently a lot and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Quite a few competition divers seem to prefer the closed muzzle. Uh, I remember Ian Puckeridge uses a similar setup and um, I'm not quite sure what Dwayne Herbert was using when we chatted to him, but you know these guys are the best of the best and they do the same thing. They yeah, they, they run a closed muzzle, just faster reloading, and uh, yeah, like you, like you sort of said, so that's ah, interesting. Yeah, I think I think for competitions, that's the main, you know, that's why you'd have one. I, I mean, there's plenty of arguments for that you can't sight it as well and things like that, and that's fine when you're going out and doing spearing all day and you've got time, but in a comp, when you're trying to, you know, shoot fish as fast as possible and, and that situation where you might have a school of fish passing through, mm. um, you, you need to be able to just be able to push them down through onto the mono and, and take off and, you know, reload and get another shot in there. Mm, cool. All right. Next part of the show is toughest situation. So what's maybe the scariest moment you've had in the ocean and, you know, what what did you sort of take away from it? What would you do differently next time? Um, the kind of... I guess there's two of them really. One, they kind of related a little bit, but um, I remember when I was sort of first got into um, spearing, like when I was young, so I was, again, I was around the 12 years, and I remember watching mum from the surface go down and try to get some crayfish, and um, as she came up, instead of backing out, she just tried to come up between these two rocks she had kind of been under, okay. and she got jammed, and I remember, and I was on the surface, and I didn't really know what was going on, and she started panicking, and was clearly running out of breath, and actually as she started to black out, she sunk back down, which made her relax, and therefore she kind of slid out of the crack, and she managed to have enough air left that she could push herself sideways and get, you know, drop her weight belt and hit the surface, wow. um, but that obviously scared the crap out of me, seeing that happen, and, and realising kind of the dangers of it and <laughs> and so that's kind of you know at that time I had no idea what I would have done if she had blacked out or how to rescue someone properly um, and that's been a big you know a big thing is with the me going to vertical blue and and learning you know the free diving and learning how to rescue someone properly um, that's I think the ma- one of the major things that I take away from it so at vertical blue same thing happened I, I actually was part of the safety team and we had a diver, he went down to, he was going for 103 meters, and I was um, the deep safety, so I was free diving as well. Yep. And uh, he, he had a, he was in trouble when he was coming up, and I actually picked him up at 32 and a half meters. I checked my watch later on. Mm. Um, and and I had been down there sitting there for a while, and you know as soon as he was coming up, I knew he was in trouble. So I grabbed him and took off for the surface, and by the time I got into the surface, he was in pretty bad state and going pretty gray, and I, you know, Oof. rescued myths and brought him round. But that was the the major thing is, you know, I, I know what to do now. And um, and I'm really thankful for it. And you know, when you see people that you know really well and in your family, and it, it's pretty scary when you're not sure what to be, at, you know, how to bring them back around if they do are in trouble. Mm. It's a compelling reason for all of us that go spearfishing to learn how to do a, a basic rescue for, in the case of a blackout, because uh, we know from drilling it ourselves, like you think you know how to do it, but until you've actually done it a couple of times, 
Yeah. Um, you, you've really, <clears throat> like, you, it, it's like you've got to train the muscles in your mind to just, you know, sort of think the way through the scenario. And in a, yep. in a panic situation, you, you really actually already want to know what you're doing. So you don't have to think too much about it because you, yeah. you're the, that stressed. And it's, the first one yeah. you see too takes a takes a little split second to sort of realise what's going on mm. with that diver. Yeah, and the second time it clicks in pretty quickly. Yeah, mm. yeah, I, I agree with you guys. Drilling it, mates. You know, even regularly, just you know, you go out and you should practice with your mates. Um, you know, you know, every sort of few months, I think you should do a one practice out there. You know, it's just as you say, it's a technique thing. So that you know, when your adrenaline's pumping and something's happening, you don't have to think about it; it just happens naturally. Mm. Yeah, no, cool. All right, well, that's very good. Um, so and we got some takeaways for that as well. Everyone can try drilling some rescues. So cool. Guys, finally a magazine Turbo won't get in trouble with his girlfriend for reading. <laughs> <laughs> Sparing Magazine, it's the world's best spearfishing magazine, and they kindly sponsor the New Spear podcast, which, funnily enough, is the world's best podcast. Oh, it's so, a match made in heaven. <laughs> Together at last. Join Sparing Magazine on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and connect with sparingmagazine.com. Today's Noob Spirit podcast is also proudly brought to you in partnership with penetratorfins.com. Get on there, guys. Have a look at some of the designs I've got. They've got clears. The blacks are beautiful. Check out the Noob Spirit custom Oki print. It's mad as well. Larry's got a full range of wicker designs, and he's got a beautiful finish on his fins. He's uh, recently updated his manufacturing process. It's even better than it was before. He makes some of the best fins in the world. Uh, he offers a full international warranty, along with $25 flat rate shipping worldwide. And uh, to, to make that offer even sweeter, pump in the code Noob Spiro at checkout and save another 20 bucks. Penetratorfins.com. Support the Noob Spiro podcast by shopping with our sponsor. Next part of the show is Veterans Vault, and uh, that's where we take our featured guest into a, an area of their expertise. Now, you've represented New Zealand in four different disciplines, and uh, I wanted to discuss sort of transferable skills from sports to spearfishing and uh, generally just training, you know, to a high level um, in any discipline. So what's sort of, uh, where do you want to start with that, Moss? <laughs> it's probably the um, easiest way to go. Yeah. I think one of the things that's probably quite simple is probably nutrition. So um, when you think about, you know, nutrition for comps or just going out there for a long day of spearing or, you you know, maybe you're going over to the tropics and you've paid, you know, you're going for a week spearing trip and you want to be spearing every single day and you want to get the most out of it, you know, and you go out for six or eight hours in the water and, you know, so therefore you want to get the most out of it. So, you know, it's important in comps, but it's that whole concept of recovery. Yep. And a lot of that can be to do with nutrition and, and also obviously if you're in the water for six or eight hours, like a competition or out there a long time, what should you be eating or drinking and when? Um, and so I think that's one area that probably a lot, of, a lot of smelly old Spiros just drink piss when they come back in, and they, you know, <laughs> chuck a hunk of meat on the barbecue, and that's probably their idea of nutrition. Yeah. Um, you're so talking, I think talking my language there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the key thing is um, one is just hydrating really well. You know, like you go out there and you should be drinking water. And one of the key things is not to. But a lot of people will drink those sort of sports drinks or Powerade and all that sort of stuff before before the effort. Yep. And all it does is give you a sugar spike of unnecessary carbohydrates that you don't actually need. Yep. So you just want to drink water initially to start with. And then once you've started doing some exercise or work, that's when you drink, start you know, needing it to replace it. Okay. So that was kind of – and then obviously hydrating well throughout that – throughout the day or through the competition or um, or obviously immediately after after the day too, you want to make sure you're taking in plenty of fluids. Hmm. Any idea on, I know it's a pretty relative question, but any idea on volume of fluid you want to, you want to take on a day's diving? Oh, it's, I mean, it's really hard to measure in the yeah. water because sweating, you can't really tell in the water, you know, so... Um, and I guess it's just, the, I mean, you can do those things where you can't, again, you can't really do it in the water unless you get out, but you look at the color of your pee and if it's like dark, kind of brown, obviously you're dehydrated and if it's clear, it's good. Once we're on the boat, um, I generally just look down at the bottom of Turbo's wetsuit and whatever's leaking out, I've got a pretty good idea about how hydrated he is, but uh, that doesn't help the rest of us, though. No, he's, so, sure he's so fatherly. He's always just looking after me, making sure I'm hydrated, <laughs> got my hat on, sunscreen on my nose, it's good. Yeah, so, all right, so we've covered off hydration what about food moss when you when you're competing in a in a spearfishing comp you don't you know maybe you're doing the the 7 a.m till 2 p.m weigh-in or whatever and you you're swimming hard all day 
what's what's your what's your food look like on that day um so you want something in the morning it's kind of got a lot of slow release carbs so generally i think porridge or oats is pretty good um and then you know guys some people have mucus problems with dairy products so if you're if that's a concern and you only have hot water or you can go to almond milk or something like that yeah um and then on that generally some you know a banana and some honey or something like that too where you've got some that come on some of those really slow release carbs around the oats but you also got some of those faster absorbing ones to kind of help you get going in the morning um and then uh, through, like a competition is quite hard. If you're, you know, out for a day spare and you've got a boat, you can kind of jump back on the boat and grab some fuel if you need it, like a, a reasonably healthy sandwich or something like that. Um, but in the competitions, um, it's a toss up between how much time do you take out to eat something um, and, and actually stop to, or do you stop and miss fish, you know? So, um, but I generally just go with some muesli bars to keep it really, really simple. And again, muesli bars, you're kind of looking, you pay more for those ones that are obviously more natural, but I think, believe the less processed food is, the better it is for you. Yeah, yeah. All right, I was going to ask you a little bit about, um, you've done some higher level sort of free diving and that have you encountered the ketogenic diet uh i'm actually looking at there's a book called at the moment called what the fat yeah and um and yeah and talking about fat as a as a fuel source rather than carbohydrates yeah so, that's that kiwi uh nutritionist isn't it he's a it is, food it is, scientist. Yeah, another, yeah. another great kiwi uh <laughs> yeah. there's actually a good kiwi <laughs> podcast oh, where uh, that guy got interviewed on it which is funnily enough why i know about it and uh yeah that guy does touch a little bit on the keto diet and um I've heard another podcast too where they discussed um, applications with it for the military and uh, because your body switches from burning uh, glycogen to uh, ketones and uh, it's got, you know, like they've measured like guys' static breath hold before and after the ketogenic diet and it has, makes a huge difference. So mm-hmm. I was curious as to yeah where your research had taken you with it. How far into the book are you? Uh, I've probably only about 50-odd pages in but... It's quite interesting looking at because a lot of the I had you know when I swam I had you know all the help that I needed I mean I had masseuse and physio and nutritionists and um, you know all those sort of things were provided to me when I swam so um, the nutritionist that I used at the time was actually the the nutritionist for the um, the All Blacks as well okay the world's greatest rugby team yeah, you know, yeah. The Kiwi team I know game. I know the All Blacks never yeah. heard of them pretty I follow, good I follow rugby league myself yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he and, follows um, rugby league it's just forward and back. <laughs> so and his his approach was is quite simple really it was um cut out again a lot of the processed foods and the carbohydrates and so it was kind of similar to what i'm reading so yeah. um yeah the main thing is you know and cutting out a lot of that sugar because if you go back to sort of the caveman area you think well you know what are the what do they used to have they didn't have access to you know making rice and bread and all the sugar and all that sort of processed food so mm-hmm. and how did they get by and what was their their food you know their main source of energy so i think there's if you look at it too the history of you know they were, obviously they were able to monetize selling carbohydrates so i think there's a it's got a lot of merits for it and um mm-hmm. yeah i'm really looking forward to sort of getting into it and trying it out yeah yeah we've both had a crack at um the paleo style <clears throat> diet which is oh. I did keto for 46 yeah. months. Yeah, keto, keto and and paleo, and paleo, which is more heavily protein, but they're both interesting with what they do to your body, and uh, and trying to maintain a functional lifestyle oh, while be, while eating keto is you did not hard. win friends with keto. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people get the shits with you. But oh, anyway, right. all right. So we've covered off nutrition, hydration. Um, what else um, with um, competing in spearfishing and, and Olympic sport? I guess there's a lot of mindset stuff. Um, how do you get yourself in the right frame of mind? Uh, right frame of mind to to compete at a high level. Um, my approach is a lot of it is just around you know as a lot of people talk about is uh, the a positive mindset or the appropriate mindset. So what is it you're trying to achieve and really stunning to believe in that and um, so you're not going there doubting yourself because if you're doubting yourself that's in the back of your mind and you're not going to do well so it was the same when I approached races and, and swam you know I, what was you know what was I trying to do and how should I be thinking to achieve that and so if you want to go out there and have a really good spearing day you know you've got to start to believe in yourself and your ability and what you're capable of doing um, and again it's similar I think swimming you can't can 
in spearing, you can control more of what other people are doing. I think, you know, there's kind of the gentleman's agreements that you don't mess with other people's burlies and their fish and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you're worrying about other competitors, you're not focusing on yourself and what you're capable of doing as well. Yeah. So, you know, in the pool, it was, it was good being aware of my competitors, but I couldn't control what they were doing. So I had to focus on myself, what I was able to do and the processes that I needed to do to be able to get the end result. So yeah. one of the things I always talked about, kind of that process, is if you're running at a flight of stairs and the top of the stairs is the goal, as in the time I wanted to go, say, in the pool, or you want to shoot a set amount of fish, if you're worried about that and not looking where your feet are landing, which is on that very first step, you're likely to trip up and fall on your face. Whereas if you run at these set of stairs and you look down and you take that first step and you're watching where your feet go and you place them, you suddenly arrive at the top of the stairs and and you've got everything right because each of those processes, you know, you got right. So I think that's kind of, you know, you look at that and it's really good to be aware of what your goal is and what you want to achieve, but you've still got to achieve all those little processes in between before you can get there. Okay. So what, what's some practical steps that you would follow before an event to to prepare your mindset? Do you do, you do visual vi- visualization like mindfulness meditations or is there some formalized process you follow or is it just something that you do unconsciously now? Uh, yeah, that was a big part of it, visualization. I think one of the big things that really helped was always the kind of what if moments, you know, when things don't go to plan. Yep. So what if you were lining up behind the blocks and suddenly your, your goal was broke and you didn't have them and you've dealt with it in your mind and you know what you're going to do and your mindset's prepared for it and ready. And, you know, and it might be as simple as oh, you've got another set of goggles with you. Um, you know, even if that you broke it, it's not like suddenly, oh, that's completely ruined your race. You can't race. So you go, yeah, oh, you've acknowledged it might not be, it might be a lot harder, but how are you going to deal with it? And it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's a mindset thing. People talk about how they view things, you know, and that's sort of is really, it's about, well, how are you going to deal with this? And instead of completely choking and going, this has ruined my day of spearfishing, you know, how can I get around that and how can I still do what I need to do? Yeah. So that's almost the opposite of goal setting. It's like fear setting. It's like, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to me in this situation? Then you, you, you deal with the things that you can control and you come, you come to terms with the things that you can't, I guess, which is, okay, that's pretty interesting. What about, what about meditation or mindfulness stuff? Do you do any of that as well, Moss? Um, I have, I think, this is, I mean, this is how deep you want to get into the <laughs> psychology of things. But one of the things that makes us unique as human beings is that we um, can be conscious of our own consciousness. Yep. So therefore, we can control what we're thinking. Um, and so that's one of the, you know, that's that's pretty cool. And um, so therefore, you can kind of choose to be able to think the way you want to think. And so that's what I'm saying about how deep you want to get into this. And it, yeah, it's yeah. kind of never ending. But it's that's where I talk about sort of appropriate thinking and saying, well, what is it you need to be thinking to be able to achieve what it is you want to achieve? I think I find it generally interesting because it's not something we've discussed on the show before, but there there is this whole mindset to high performance that, you know, like I've only probably just become aware of it in recent years. And I, I think there's a, it's a full-on sort of thing all unto itself. And, I mean, you've competed in four sports at a really high level. So I did want to dig in a little bit into sort of what your process was. So it's good hearing your thoughts. Um, well, one of the things I actually find interesting with the mindset, and I've thought about this a lot, and it'll be interesting to see what you guys think, but, you know, how many times do you go out spearfishing when you've only got a camera in your hand or you don't have a gun at all and you see these amazing fish? Mm. And then, you you know, or even at the end of the, at the start of a day where you go, you know, like you start off and you go, I'm not going to spear any butterfish because they're all there. And then you get <laughs> to the end of the day and you haven't speared any fish and you go, I'm going to shoot a whole lot of butterfish to take home and there's, you just see none of them. None uh, of them are. I, I actually did this exact thing on my life. Last yeah. uh, reef trip, I <clears throat> I'd been shooting plenty of fish, and I grabbed the camera off the boat, put my gun back on, and I went off. I said, I'll just I thought I'll get some nice footage of the reef, swam off, and as I was going across, I thought, bet you I see something I want to shoot or I haven't shot before, and yeah. straight up within about oh, 45 seconds, little yeah. coral cod come out, and I was just like, I haven't shot one of them. <laughs> went straight back to the boat, camera got just tossed up on the top, <laughs> so I grabbed the gun straight into it, and I was just thinking, wow, I like, just happened on cue, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, it definitely happens. I, I, I think that's that kind of the vibe you put out, you know, mm. when you don't have, it's not like fish must die and mm. so you don't have the gun with you. Yeah. And then it's really interesting because I thought, well, how can you replicate that kind of mindset with a gun in your hand so the mm. fish don't get that sense of that you really want to shoot them? But then at the same time, you, you do. So how do you kind of mask it? So that's that's something I haven't come to grips with. It's really interesting. Yeah. Way I've gone out on the boat before and I've had a I've had a species list of stuff that I want to hit that day mm. and uh, adrenaline just coursing through my veins and just super pumped to be out, haven't been out for a while and shot bugger all. And then, you know, like two weeks later going out and just thinking, you know what, I'm just going to have fun with my mates today and just absolutely having a ball and shooting everything, 
you know, and so yeah. It, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to it that we haven't sort of um, explored. I think I, I sort of find if you if you're on a trip and you've got say five or six days in the water. On on the fifth day, fifth or sixth day, you're that relaxed. Everything just falls into place, and you just you can just shoot whatever you like. That's what it seems seems to happen anyway. Mm. So all that edge is gone. Yeah. What's um? Have you read any books, or what are your favourite resources for um, spearfishing moss? Um, a lot of it's just actually chatting to other people and watching videos. Um, there's some really good spearows in New Zealand. I've met some really good spearows overseas, and there's a guy actually. I spent some time in Trinidad and Tobago because I actually um traveled for a year and then I worked six and a half months on a super yacht and when I did that I was the spear fishing and free diving guide and safety diver on there as well oh okay um, and so I spent some time in Trinidad and Tobago and I met a guy Richard Parkinson okay um, and he's a oh, sea no. hunt extreme is what he goes by him and his dad um, and he's a super knowledgeable guy and he used to work in the Seychelles for a, a very rich man as well and he used to be a spear fishing guy one of the spear fishing guides there so a lot of stories from him about Chris Coates and people like that you know so it was just talking to people and learning a lot about their setups and what they thought and how to hunt fish and I think that's the main thing you know is just that enthusiasm like talking to people and getting out there and showing your enthusiasm for it and you know that it makes a massive difference when you meet people and they just see that on your face your enthusiasm and they, they know you want to learn mm. I've actually been trying to contact Richard and come on the show but doesn't return my calls, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen oh, him around the traps. I've, n- I've never approached him to come on for an interview, but we'll have to do that yeah. sometime in the future. I'll reach out to him for you guys. Oh, oh legend. Wonderful. Yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, um, like um, if you if you were going to like the world champs in Greece last year, Moss, uh, mm. I know the Kiwi guys, Dwayne Herbert and uh, Julian Hansford and Dave Mullins, they 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 went there and they 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 scouted and they they actually did a fair bit of training beforehand, and they were doing some phenomenal diving. Um, if you were going to be part of that team, what would your training process look like leading up to the comp, and how long would you would you ideally want to spend on it? Well, see, Greece is slightly different in the fact that it was really deep diving, um, and so I think one of the things that's kind of stopped me from really pushing my own free diving is that depth adaptation and having those barrow traumas. Yeah. Uh, so obviously I've got the breath, you know, I've, I've done a six minute breath hold and I've got the capability of the kick to do go a lot deeper. I've been a 52. Yeah. Um, but the thing that's kind of, I'm stopping myself on purpose with is just that I know my body is unlikely to be able to handle deeper dives. Okay. And I think, you know, those guys, Dwayne and Julian and, and, and even Dave, they, they experienced some decompression sickness over there with diving repeatedly really di- deep. And, um, and I think that's one of the big things is that you'd have to start training really early, you know, a couple of years out to be able to kind of for your body to be able to handle that. Yeah, right. Um, so you can, be, you can be really fit and, um, you know, you can jump on a bike. I think cycling gives you really good leg endurance and good fitness for, for kicking. And you can hit the gym and you can, you know, do swimming and all those things and build up. But I think at the end of the day for deep diving like world champs, it's the depth, the barrow traumas that you've got to be really, really careful of. Mm. Yeah, lots of guys with lung squeezes and decompression yeah. sickness. We've heard a fair bit about it, to be honest. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to get a couple of the guys that, that competed on the show soon. So, but um, yeah, no, interesting. All right. So if, if you were going to have a training regime for maybe a competition that wasn't as deep uh, as, yeah. as the Greece, what, what, how long would you want and what would you do specifically? I mean, <laughs> how ser- are we looking at this from the perspective of, of me and re- quite serious or from the perspective of kind of, uh, you know, yeah, that's the thing is, is how serious do you want to take? I mean, to me, a good build up is really about six months. Okay, wow. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the training cycles that we went in for swimming. So you'd have, you know, your your, your trials for the Olympics or Com Games or World Champs, and then you would, um, and you'd fully taper for that. So you, you know, you ease off your training for it, and then you'd go and race, and then you'd build it back up again before the major events. So it's about a six month cycle, um, and the first sort of month is really easing into it, and then you'd have a solid, really, um, couple of months after that where you really start to build up. The distance and endurance that you're training for. So, say you were you're jumping in the pool and you're on the bike and um, and doing some mileage and just getting back into it, and then you can really start to ramp it up from there. Yeah, right. Uh, and again, nutrition is key. You know, like the reason you train really early. If you're training more than once a day, if you train really early in the morning and then again late at night, it's because you want the maximum amount of recovery period in between. 
Um, so when I was professionally swimming, you know, I'd go home and I'd just eat and I'd sleep during the day. And then I'd get up and train in the afternoon. I'd come home and I'd eat and I'd sleep at night. So, wow. um, again, that's just depends. You know, most people like myself these days, I've got work. So it's more like, okay, well, yeah, yeah. I go sparing in the weekends and afterwards I might, might be able to go for a, a swim early morning before work. And, yeah. you know, but even just biking to work and back and, you know, those sort of things can really help. And I think just putting the main thing with any training thing is putting in place a schedule and making yourself once it becomes routine. So it takes sort of three weeks to get into something. And once it becomes routine, it's not that hard to do. Yeah. So, you know, if you said, oh, I'm going to swim, you know, go down to the local swim squad and swim twice, twice a um, week. And I'm going to bike to work three times and back, you know, three times a week and back. And, and then make sure when I, in the weekends I go out for a spear, when I go spear fishing, I'm actually going to swim some decent distances to be able to get that endurance going. And, and I think that would be the key, you know, is, okay. is what's actually manageable there. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to think about what's reasonable and, and work it in with your life. Yeah, which is, just, this is very practical, yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, given ideal circumstances, maybe you'd take it a lot more seriously. No, good answer. Um, yeah. All right, I think we've wrapped up um, or, or we're wrapping it up. Any sort of parting stuff you want to say in regards to – um, you know, advice for guys training for competitions or wanting to take spearfishing a lot more seriously from a training point of view? I mean, I, yeah, again, I think it's just that. How committed do you want to be, you know? And I, from what I've discovered over the years, your body can take a lot more than you realize um, punishment when you start training it, you know? So it's really a mind, it comes down to a mindset thing. How, how hard do you really want to push it? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. Hey guys, if you're new to spearfishing, I highly recommend listening to our episode Free Diving for Spearfishing with Pete Ryder. Pete uh, is an entrepreneur and an excellent freedive instructor, and he has come up with two great courses the 10 meter freedive and the 5 minute freediver. I've used the 5 minute freediver to increase my bottom time, found it incredibly useful for my trip to the Coral Sea, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. His other course, the 10 meter freediver, is a great resource for those just starting out that literally want to get to 10 meters and this course will help you learn proper breathing technique and some of the safety aspects associated with freediving. Use the code NOOPSPIRO to save 20% on all of Pete's courses. He's put together this deal just for listeners of the show. That's at howtofreedive.com. Use the code NOOPSPIRO. God bless America, guys. We're joined by Spearing Magazine today. Isn't that right, Turbo? Absolutely. You've done it again. USA. USA. <laughs> God bless America. Now, if you love America and you love spearfishing, <laughs> get hold of Spearing Magazine at spearingmagazine.com. Hoorah. That's all the American stuff I Semper know. Semper Fi. Chevrolet. <laughs> <laughs> look, look guys the magazine is way better than turbo's american accent probably better than mine too you can um check out check them out on social media actually head on facebook or instagram youtube whatever's your thing find sparing magazine and join those folks they they put up some wicked photos and stories check them out sparingmagazine.com Well, next part of the show, a different note, is the funniest thing. What's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? Um, I, was, I guess it was one of the funniest stories is um, my first ever golden snapper. Okay. Um, and I was out actually with Nat Davey, who uh, you know recently speared that 50 kilo plus kingy. Yep. Um, and so I was out with him, and we were spearing off the coast of New Zealand up in the far north, yep. and, uh, and he had the spot where he knew some golden snapper were. So he went into it, and there was sort of 35 metres to the bottom. Okay. And so, and I was really only getting to my free diving then, so that, you know, that's a deep dive, and, yeah. it's, and it's a deep dive with a spear gun in your hand, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. And so, um, you know, I had a 30 metre float line, and Nat said they're here, so I dove down the sort of side of, side of this bombing, this pinnacle that came up, and... Um, Got down to the bottom at 30 meters, saw the golden snap. I took a shot and missed, and had to come all the way back to the surface. And it was a really cruddy day too, crappy water, and <laughs> wasn't nice diving in it at all. Yeah. And uh, and so I hit the surface, and Nat's like, you know, did you get one? And I was like, nah, I missed. And he's like, oh, no bugger. And he's like, okay, reload. So I reload, breathed up again, dived again. This time I went down, and I was a bit more relaxed about the actual dive, and dived down. Problem is my float line maxed out. So as I went to take the shot, the, the, the surface, the boy on the um, surface moved and my aim came off and I missed again. Yeah. I come back to the surface, you know, Nat's there again and all the, the other boys and they were like, can you get one? And I was like, nah, I missed again. Like, Jesus, you know, like what's going on? And I was like, oh, and I was getting really pissed off. 
So third dive, again, breathe up, dive down, think I've got it. And uh, and I don't know. And apparently one of the boys on the surface, my float line maxed out again. He actually grabbed my boy and started forcing it down under the water, swimming it down oh. to try to help me out. Yeah. And uh, and I took a took the third shot and I was just really nervous this time and I missed again. <laughs> <laughs> So I hit the surface, and they were, yeah. and, you know, all the boys are giving me a lot of stick, and I was just like, I'm ready to get out of the water. Like, <laughs> I got these golden snap, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I said, give it one more go, and I said, okay. And I went down there. Same thing happened. Like, one of the boys swam the float down. Uh, I, actually cha- I actually changed float lines in the end, um, and I swam down, and I finally nailed one. So oh, nice. I, the, the golden snapper were at my absolute nemesis. But, <laughs> and, so I, yeah, and the funny thing is, though, we went up to Three Kings again with Nat, and uh, he found up there you can get golden snapper on the surface, and I found one, though, in 13 metres where he spotted it. He said, it's just down here under the rock, swim down, and I swam down, and I <laughs> went to take a shot, and I missed it again. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, uh. so, I can't live down Golden Snapper. Nat yeah. always reminds me of what about my nemesis fish. Yeah, oh, I love the honesty. Good story. <laughs> I think we've all had a fish like that. Um, yeah. Mine was king mackerel, Spanish mackerel. Bloody things. I lost that many of them before I landed one. And uh, I think everyone's got one of those fish. So well, At least you were hitting them. <laughs> oh, yeah, but even that took a while. And like sometimes still now, if I haven't been out for a while, Mm. And I see them swimming underneath me. I'm like a friggin' steam train oh, and just yeah. spook everything within Jesus. five kilometres. So, we, yeah, it's funny the, the habits you get into. They're, yeah. Yeah, you get really excited when you I see do. mackerel. I do. Like, it's I ridiculous. Do. I love them. <clears throat> I love them. All right, what are we up to? Dive bag. So, um, all right, Moss, what, what's your spearfishing pretty cold water what's in your uh your dive bag what are you loving at the moment and uh yeah just run us through what you use in your day-to-day dives um yeah so the water here's been pretty cold it hasn't warmed up that much there's only just starting to wipe now so i've been in my i've got a had a sort of a boche five mil mm-hmm. but i've been wearing the boche five mil top and the three mil moray bottoms so moray is a local kiwi brand here okay um and then for blades i'm using the ruku blades which also Kiwi made and they're they're pretty good. They take a real beating, and you know a lot of the the commercial divers use them. Yep. Uh, and I've got them in Pathos foot pockets though, because again I like with the competitions in mind. I like having light gear, so the Pathos foot pockets are pretty solid. There's a fair bit of rigidity to them, but also they're really light for those sort of long six hour plus comps. Mm. And uh, and using the the Pathos 120 carbon with the closed muzzle. Yeah, right. They've got a cult following with some of their equipment, the old Pathos guys, and some guys are like that real particular with those foot pockets um but they 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 get mixed reviews but some people that use them love them so yeah no good stuff mm. anything else of note in your dive bag you use a dive watch uh yeah i've got the i was lucky enough actually when i was over um safety diving for william trubridge he he gave me one of the um sunto d4i's so i use oh. that um but it's quite interesting i remember when i first got my dive watch Initially, I you know I ended up monitoring myself and my spearfishing really really heavily. So I was sort of like, how long was that dive? How deep was that dive? And it actually made my spearfishing worse. So I realised that after a few months, and I actually took it off for about three months and didn't wear it. So I think it's a, watches are really good to have, but at the same time, you don't want to get too caught up in them. Yeah, yeah, we've we've chatted with like so many guys lately that use that Sunto D4i. The uh, Novo watch, and uh, everyone's been talking about it. Pe- people can get it at our sponsor's uh, website, spearfishing.com.au, if they like. But, um, yeah, it's a it's a very well-reviewed dive watch. I, I'm kind of curious about it now, actually. There's just been too many guys on that talk about it. I actually had a lesser branded or cheaper branded dive watch, and I've never had a watch leak so bad. Like, that thing was always taking on water. It yeah. was just shocking. It was worse than just every like, servo cheap watch. <laughs> Worst thing ever. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, anything else in your dive bag you wanted to chat about, Moss? Mask and snorkel? Uh, nah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like I've um, I've been lucky enough to be helped out sort of by Boche and Ruku and and Ocean Hunter who sell those that gear and also the West Shell which sell the Pathos gear. So okay, yeah, it's pretty pretty good to be supported like that, and I really appreciate their help. Yeah, no, cool. Are you, uh, are you what, what mask are you using? Um, I'm just using one. Of, I actually just rebought one. <laughs> I bought my first one when I was in um, Turkey, and it was just a, a no-name one, which is really low volume, though. So yeah. um, I just, you know, I look for a mask that has really low volume, but just fits really well. Cool. All right. Last section of the show is Spiro Q and A. So this is sort of like a faster pace around of questions, but um, let's get started with what's the single best piece of advice you've been given for spearfishing? Uh, go to the well, join the freediving club. All right. 
Oh, nice. That was super short. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for like oh, the, a big explanation. Beautiful. Oh. All right. <laughs> Who's been the most influential person in your spearfishing and why? Uh, I don't have to say two be one my parents um, because they got me into the sport. Yep. Um, but then with the actual improving my spear fishing, it would have to be diving with uh, my mate Nat Davy. So I learned an awful lot from him, and uh, and we go out a lot. And uh, he's just a, a great mate, and I really appreciate all the help and and time I get to spear with him. Yeah, he seems like a top bloke. We just had him on the show recently. Um, so yeah, cool. Um, if you had to start out spear fishing all over again, what would you do differently? Uh, I wouldn't really change the. F- I would just say get in the water. You know, that a whole lot of time spent in the water and be able to see all the fish and how they act and behave is, I think, has done massive benefits for me. So you can be really fit and fast, but you've also got to be able to learn how to hunt the species and what they do. So that's been a massive benefit. All right, cool. Last question is: um, if a new guy's chatting with you about getting started spearfishing, what are the sort of the two or three uh, bits of advice that you would probably give them? Uh, first one would be show your enthusiasm and, and you know to get into those groups of sparrows and get into the on their boats and going out with them so show how enthusiastic you are and, and help out and try to get on the boats and, and out there yep um, and, and the other one would just be well as I said you know get in the water a lot you know being so that's one way is going out with those guys but getting in the water and, and again like joining the freediving club really helped with that because 90% of the freedivers are also sparrows so you get to you know improve your your breath hold and things like that, but again, a lot of the the talk ends up being about spearfishing. Yeah, mm. yep, yep, yeah, cool. Uh, oh, just quickly, um, yeah, underwater hockey in general. What do you think of it as a as a tool for training for spearos? Apart from being a good social environment, um, how do you think it translates to spearfishing as a training tool? Um, really good for leg endurance and CO two tolerance and things like that. Uh, for breath hold it's because you're generally going up and down pretty quick and not staying down that long um it's probably not really conducive to doing long breath holds and having a big long bottom time yeah um but i think i think for off season you know like it's it's a great sport for that and again that leg endurance and being able to learn and speed up like really kick really fast and it's it's great for that so i definitely i rate it as one of the better training aids or more more specific Spearfishing. Um, yeah, cool. All right, Moss. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. I've enjoyed learning about sort of, you know, some of the transferable skills from the different disciplines you've, um, you know, encountered along your way. And um, and uh, I've, I've actually enjoyed hearing some more uh, Kiwi stories about spearfishing. Mm. Always good, always haven't, a pleasure. Haven't we all? And uh, look, people can find you on social media. I take it. Where can, where can people come and have a look at your stuff? Yeah, so I've got um, like a Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter is sort of the main one. I guess for spearing picks is the Instagram, but all of them are just my full name, which is uh, Moss Burmester. So M-O-S-S and then Burmester is B-U-R-M-E-S-T-E-R. So yeah. most of them up there, I've sort of, you know, I mentioned, you know, that I'm a Kiwi and I swam, so <laughs> I should be reasonably easy to find. Yeah, no worries. And uh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll link all those up in the show notes. You've got a website too. It's, yep, yep. The website is kind of more targeted to my um, sporting background rather than, you know, there's underwater hockey and surf life saving and swimming rather than the spearing. But um, yeah, so, but it's, um, yeah, if anyone wants to know sort of more there or reach out to me, ask me any questions around, you know, I, I enjoy being able to help um, sort of young athletes coming through New Zealand and, and try to get them on the world stage, especially swimmers. So it's, um, yeah. All right. All Thanks, right, Moss. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on today's show. As always, we've had a blast recording it. And as we all know, every good Spiro needs a good supplier of good equipment. Now, you can find that good equipment at spearfishing.com.au. That's right, our show sponsor, Adreno. Their online store can be found at spearfishing.com.au. And if you use the code NoobSpiro at checkout, you'll save yourself $20 on all purchases over $200. So get online and check those guys out. Bloody crap, cracker episode there. Turbo was all over it as usual, asking the pointed questions, and uh, I sat in the background pretending to uh, keep keep us on track. Uh, but bloody cracker with Moss. I hope you enjoyed that interview and got something out of you know, uh, you know, out of his expertise. You know, competing in four four disciplines at a national level is bloody impressive, and uh, he's a he's a top bloke, really nice guy. You can find him on Facebook. Uh, now. 
we also talk a little bit about training regimes this episode. If you want to get into a training regime of your own, there's two programs available at howtofreedive.com. You can jump on there. Pete Wright has designed it from the UK. There's, there's two. There's one for brand new Sparrows. It's basically just everything you need, all the information you need to learn how to get down to 10 metres. This just gives you a really good idea about all the basics and fundamentals to get started uh, freedive spearfishing. And if you're a bit more advanced, a lot more advanced, maybe you've done a freediving course, but you want some on, ongoing training, try the uh, five minute freediver. It's a, it's a training, it's, a, it's quite a brutal training regime that you do every day for 30 days. So by the end of it, you'll be holding your breath for, for, for five minutes. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. Turbo did it. Um, I haven't done it yet. Uh, I don't plan to uh, in the near future, but I will do it when, it when I head back for my next big trip. Now, um, get in there, try, try the free tasters out, and, uh, and get, get an idea if you like the course or not. If you do decide to purchase, use the code NoobSparrow and save 20%. Also, guys, thanks for listening today. Leave us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Always helps. And uh, in a fortnight's time, we are joined by Eris Betis. And uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's an uh, Israeli, uh, Australian-based freediving instructor. He's uh, renowned throughout the world for his methods. And uh, he's a really interesting bloke. It's a top interview. Tune in and join us again in a fortnight. Thanks for listening, guys. The other day, we were just having a chat about what we wished was around when we were starting spearfishing. We thought, geez, I wish there was an e-book called 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. <laughs> and guess what? Now there is, thanks uh, to us. Amazon.com, a cheap as chips, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Written by yours truly, Turbo and the Shrekinator. It's actionable information from... More than 40 interviews with spearfishing experts from around the world. It's absolutely jam-packed with tips. Now, every tip Value is not tips. just a single tip. There's tips within tips. So There's tips over and under tips. So we had to pick a number. We're at 99. There's probably 1,000. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe 1,005. Possibly. So where can they find it? Amazon.com. 99 tips to get better at spearfishing by Turbo and... Shriek. Shrek. What's your name again? Shrek.